Some of you know that Aaron wrote that, wrote that song, what, two years ago? Something like that, two years ago, um, in a series that we did on the Psalms of Ascent. And as I was sort of processing through uh, the last seven years, um, that song came back to me, Aaron, because I just, I love the way that you, uh, the, the trinkets that we make, they always squeak, they always break. And um, there's been a lot of that over the last seven years, you know, squeaking, breaking, uh, things that didn't go the way I planned it. And yet, and yet, I've just had this sense that God has multiplied um, the work. And so, thank you. Thanks for um, singing that today. Uh, I want to begin by just saying thank you to, to my wife, Kelly. Um, I, I've been um, pastor here for uh, seven years and uh, two months, three months actually, um, seven years and two months. And I, I think Kelly has missed maybe two sermons, maybe uh, one, um, and it was because the kids were sick. And, uh, and so I'm just really grateful for, um, for a wife that is so amazingly supportive. So thank you. I love you. I love you. The last, uh, the last two months for me has been uh, a roller coaster, to say the least. We, uh, we had the chance uh, to go to Disneyland um, on our vacation that we were on two weeks ago. And I can tell you that Disneyland has nothing um, on two months of processing a move across the country. That, that, that's been a way better roller coaster than anything we rode there. And um, it, it's been an interesting journey, to be quite honest with you. Um, one that I, in many ways, didn't see coming, the emotional journey that I, I've been on. Uh, and that we've been on together as a family. Um, I, I've experienced things like sort of these mini panic attacks and um, immense sadness and a little bit of anger and immense doubt um, in, in the midst of it all. And, and I knew that this day was coming. And um, I woke up this morning and it was sort of that Brian Regan thing of like, oh, it's due today right? Like, it's that, that is today as I'm wiping the sleep out of my eyes and sort of just uh, getting off the plane the, the morning before from teaching for a week at Cannon Beach. And, and, and so this day, though I've been getting ready for it in so many ways, it's just sort of um, snuck up on me. And it's hard for me to believe that this is my last Sunday standing in the pulpit here as lead pastor of South Fellowship Church. I've, um, over the last few weeks, I've tried my best to take some time to, to remember and to reminisce a little bit and to do so um, with thanksgiving, and that has been such a natural thing because, because um, God has been so abundantly good. And um, Kelly and I, last night, as we were lying in bed and, and just talking, we had just um, gotten home from a night with our friends in our neighborhood, who are some of our best friends in, in the whole world, and we just said to each other, this is, this is so hard because it's been so good in every phase of our life here. So I've thought about what do I preach on the last Sunday that I have with you, and, and what do I try to impart, and to be quite honest, I feel like my bucket's a little bit empty today, but um, I'm going to do my best to impart something to you that I hope gives maybe a little bit of framework for where we've been over the last seven years, and, and, and hopefully a, a launching pad for this next season for life as a community of faith as South Fellowship Church. Will you hand me that clicker, Larry? You just toss it to me. Thanks. And what I'm reminded of is that transition in the church is as old as the church. Uh, th this is something that's not new. It's actually something that's ancient. It's something that, that's old. I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul as he's saying goodbye to the elders of the church at Ephesus. It's a church that he helped start, that he pastored for three years. These are people that he grew to, 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 to love deeply. And he says this. He said, as in, when we had said many things, it's his, his goodbye to the elders and leaders of that church. He said he knelt down and he prayed with them. And there was much weeping on the part of all. 
they embraced Paul and they kissed him and then they sent him off to Jerusalem. You can go read in Acts chapter 13, verses 2 and 3, the church is having this prayer meeting and worship time and uh, the church in Antioch and the Spirit of God says to them, send out Paul and Barnabas. And it, and it seems like it's that next day that Paul and Barnabas are on a ship heading to Cyprus to start their very first missionary journey. Can you imagine missing that prayer meeting? You get there the next day and your pastor and teacher for the past year, they're gone. They're gone. And transition in the church is as old as the church. That, that doesn't make it easy. It just means that we have a little bit of perspective on what this looks like and, and how this goes. And so if you have a Bible and you want to follow along today, I'm going to be camping out in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses, primarily verses 5 through 9. Context is that the Apostle Paul has planted the church in Corinth. He's no longer the pastor there. And a man by the name of Apollos has come in after him to be the leader and teacher and one of the pastors in that church. And there's some people that are saying, we like Paul better, and others that are saying, well, we follow Apollos. And what Paul tries to do in the first few chapters here is just reframe that whole discussion. And here's what he says in verse 5 of chapter 3, 1 Corinthians. He says, and what then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God made it grow. Uh, you know, Paul might say, and God multiplied it. He took the trinkets and he multiplied it. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is really anything, but it's God who makes it grow. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. I was struck by the fact that I didn't plant this church. Uh, Dale Schlafer did back in 1979. Brad Strait came to pastor it after that. And then in 2012, God graciously called Kelly and I to come and to water. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, as I've tried to think about what this last seven years have been, th this is the image that just came to my mind. I I'm just... I'm just, here's how I want to say it today. I'm just a man with a can partnering with a God who had a plan. <laughs> and <laughs> you thought that was way more funny than I did. I, I was like, that was I was thinking, this is profound. And you're like, no. Um, and, and as I've looked at the last seven years, this is sort of the image that has come to my mind. I'm reminded of John chapter 9 where there's this um, little boy who comes to Jesus and um, Jesus has, all these people are, are just hanging on every word that Jesus has and every word that he's saying and they've gathered on this hillside and there's no food and the disciples ask, well, how are we going to feed all of these people? And this little boy goes, well, well, I've got, a, I've got five loaves of bread and I've got two fish. And Jesus said to him, you have a gluten addiction. You, why would you have five loaves of bread for lunch? No, he didn't. He didn't say that. Um, he said, bring it to me. Bring it to me. He brought it to him. And Jesus took that, what seemed like a totally insignificant, completely insufficient amount of food, looked at 5,000 people, and somehow, somehow took what was insignificant and insufficient and multiplied it. And over the last seven years, um, I, I've just imperfectly, oh, oh man, horribly imperfectly, um, but I, I think the picture I have is I'm just, I'm just taking my two fish and my five loaves, and I'm taking my can, and God's filling it up as he's gracious, and I've just had the chance over seven years to um, see God multiply my life, our lives. And um, man, to say that I'm grateful is an understatement. 
One of the tensions that this passage, this text points out is, that, and I think it's this tension that we all wrestle with, whether we're in quote-unquote vocational ministry or um, whether we work in business or whatever, how, whatever our life looks like, whether we're um, a mom who stays home and raises kids or whether we're retired, we, we have this, this tension, especially as people who want to follow the way of Jesus. Here's the tension. Here's the tension. M- we, we wrestle with thinking that, man, my work doesn't matter. God's just going to do what God's going to do. And I want to just gently, pastorally, in the last sort of um, time that I have with you as, as, as your pastor, to say to you, that is an absolute lie. Your life and your work matters greatly. Somebody needed to bring the food to Jesus for him to multiply it. And Jesus is gracious enough to invite you into his story to bring your gifts and to bring your talents and to bring who you are to him and give them to him and to see what he might do with them. And so I think that's one polarity that we wrestle with, is we wrestle with thinking, my life and my work and what I contribute to this church or to this community, that it doesn't matter. And then there's the other polarity of thinking that it all depends on us. Um, Larry, who's um, one of my best friends in the entire world, usually on Sunday mornings at some point will pull me aside and he'll say, remember, this all depends on you. (laughs) He did it again today. It's my, he's speaking my love language of sarcasm, okay? Um, But it's, it's his way of reminding me Ryan, you're, you're, just a, you're just a man with a can partnering with a God who has a plan. That's all you are. And um, man, I, I've needed that reminder. I've needed that reminder. And, and maybe you do too. Maybe you do too. To reject the polarity of thinking it all depends on me and the polarity of thinking my life doesn't matter at all but we all live in this beautiful, mysterious in-between of somehow what we bring to the table matters deeply and somehow it's God who infuses all of it with meaning. And so the Apostle Paul is going to unpack this tension and um, I'm, this is more just from my heart today, uh, but I want to give you just a few things that I hope would be an encouragement to you and sort of some takeaways as we start to, as we look back a little bit together and as we start to look forward. But here's what he says in verse five. He goes, what is Apollos and what is Paul? And then who does he say that they are? What are they? They're servants. They're servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. Now, this translation makes it seem as though the Lord is assigning belief to each. In the Greek, it's actually really, really clear. What he's assigning to each is a task, a task. And Paul and Apollos had this role to serve the church, to serve the church. And they did it in a way that's just simply following the instruction of Jesus. And here's what Jesus said to his disciples. He called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over people. And their great ones exercise authority over them. That's still the way of the world. If you have the power, if you have the influence, if you have the money, if you have the fame, use it for yourself. But it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This isn't just unique for those who are in leadership in the church, but I mean, I want you to know that every believer is a servant, and every servant has a task. Every servant has a task. And sometimes we sort of get the opportunity to choose what our task is. And sometimes our task is, is given to us. 
But what I'm reminded of, number one, is that I'm, I'm not the master. If I'm a servant, I'm, I'm not the master. I just get to come under the wings of the master. I get to, to, to live in his wind, in his spirit, in his love, his goodness. I don't need to control it. My role as a follower of Jesus is to be a servant, and that means I don't need to call all the shots. I just get to live under the good master. And I shared with you a little bit about how God started to sort of what Kelly and I felt like maybe start to reassign our task. And I shared some of that with you in, this, in the message that I gave when I started to say, listen, this might, we might be moving and God seems like he might be leading in this way. But I want to give you a little bit fuller picture of what that looked like for us. Because I know there's some of you who may be wrestling with this idea, well, um, Ryan, how do you know, number one, and are you just seizing an opportunity? Is that what this is about? As you know, probably, back in January and February, I did a series called Life is Amazing, and it was about discerning and discovering God's will, and it really started to mess with me a little bit. About three quarters of the way through it, I was approached by the church in California, Manual Faith to ask if I'd be interested in interviewing for their lead pastor job. I had turned them down a, a year and a half before for um, a role there, and they called me, and I said, no, I'm, I'm happy at South, I love South, and um, hung up the phone and said, oh, thank goodness. Um, then I started preaching on Jonah, and I gave a message entitled Life on the Run, and I was driving home from church preaching and just thinking, Man, Lord, I wonder if I'm running from you, number one, but number two, I'm so glad I already said no. <laughs> and then the search firm that Emmanuel Faith was working with emailed me and said, Ryan, uh, we heard your name floating around. Are you interested in having a conversation? I gave them a list of reasons why I was a terrible choice for them. Um, and they said, well, if some of those are sort of put off to the side, are you interested in having a conversation? And I said, um, well, maybe, well, maybe. Uh, on March 10th, I had a meeting with um, uh, Janice and Craig Hammersmith. I hope it's okay that I call you out in front of everyone. Sorry. Um, and we uh, had lunch over uh, at Corner Bakery. They were sharing with me God's prompting in their life to start thinking about missions and potentially moving their family of six uh, to Luxembourg in the next season. And I drove home from that meeting and thought, they're willing to move to Luxembourg, and I'm not willing to move to San Diego. On April 4th, uh, Jody Nevins, um, who's uh, on staff with us, we have a standing meeting once a month just to catch up. She came into my office and she said to me, Ryan, I was really nervous to meet with you today. And I said, well, you, you better be because you're, you know, I'm just, I'm just. And she said, you know, and so uh, I, I told Eric I was feeling that way and Eric said, why don't you just pray about a question to ask Ryan? And so she said, Okay, and nothing came to her. She went to bed that night, woke up at one in the morning, and she said, the question was really, really clear that I was supposed to ask you. I said, great. She said, what would it look like for us? This is what I'm supposed to ask you. What would it look like for us as a church to accomplish the mission and the vision without you as involved? And at this point, nobody knew that any of these conversations were happening. The only person that knew at that point was Larry. And I went... Are you kidding me? And she said, and then I went downstairs. I couldn't get back to sleep. And I was just sort of listening to my uh, Bible meditation app, just praying and praising. And she said, the word that came to me was just really crystal clear that I was supposed to give to you. And it's, the word is release, release. And it was just this process, you guys, of, of God just slowly pulling our fingers off of something that we loved. Going, all right. From there, it got weird, if that isn't weird enough. <laughs> uh, so that was April 4th. April 15th, and we're still going, hey, God, we're not, we're, not, we're not with you on this. I got a text message from somebody I've never met before, and they said this. Hi, Ryan, my name is Kelly. And I'd like to speak with you about purchasing 7584 South Ogden Way. Did I reach the right person? Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
And I wrote back and said, no, absolutely not. We are not interested in selling. In the back of my mind, I'm going, what is going on? And you can write that off of circumstance. That, that's totally fine. I'm actually really okay with that. But some of the ways God speaks and moves is through circumstance. And so I asked our neighbors, our friends, hey, did you guys get this text? Like, are they just looking for like, houses in our neighborhood to buy? Or like, what's the deal, right? Nobody else. Nobody else. April 20th, Kelly and I sit down on our couch after a long day. We look at what's on our DVR. We like the show Restaurant Impossible, and there was a new season and a new episode. We hadn't watched a show in a year, and we're like, oh, let's watch that. And we um, put on Restaurant Impossible, and where was the episode filmed? Escondido, California. May 5th, I went to meet with um, one of the people in our congregation, and she's been a missionary in Democratic Republic of Congo for 40 years, and it was just this, this really encouraging and, and sacred meeting that we had for about uh, almost two hours, and at one point, she said to me, she started to quote this hymn, and I said, Norma, what, what hymn is that? I've never heard that hymn, and she said, oh, the hymn is, it's entitled, um, I'll go where you want me to go. <laughs> May 24th, I, I was just, I, I was having it out with God. I told Kelly, I feel like I'm gonna run, on a runaway train and I don't know how I got here and I, don't where the, no, and I know where this is going and I'm not sure I like it. And I was really wrestling with leaving my dad and, and Kelly's folks. And it's just. And uh, just in my normal reading through the Bible in a year, I, I came to this passage. Peter said to Jesus, we've left all we had to follow you. Truly, I say to you, Jesus, or truly, I tell you, Jesus said, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come in eternal life. So May 29th, we flew out to California. I preached there and I said, God, if they don't vote at least 90%, I'm not going. And I'm like praying for an 89 to just say, okay, I knew it. I knew all this was messing with me. And the vote was over 95%. Got home on June 2nd, the night of June 2nd, on June 3rd, we sort of had to make this decision. And I wrote an acceptance letter. And um, through, through tears, wrote an acceptance letter. And um, I said to Kelly, I, I just can't send it. You may think I'm a little bit melodramatic and all that stuff. Maybe <laughs> think whatever you want at this point. I don't care. Um, I, I'm actually usually a fairly stable person. <laughs> just, just been a mess. Um, I said, I can't send it. And I went out on a run. I ran my normal loop that I just love. And on my run, I had this idea. I'm going to write a decline letter also. And I'm going to see which one feels more in line with what God's doing. And I wrote a decline letter. And I felt like I worded it really well. <laughs> and I said, Kelly, I want you to read both these letters. And I want you to tell me what you think God's doing. And she read them. And she said, you know, Ryan, I think we, Ryan, we just, we know. We know. that the assignment has been reassigned. And we're servants, not the master. And we don't call the shots. Here's a few implications for us, I think, as a community of faith. The, the person who follows me as lead pastor of South Fellowship Church we'll have the same job description, but in a lot of ways, we'll have a different task. The task is 
contextual. The task is unique. My, my task for seven years was different than the task that they'll have because the church is a different place than it was seven years ago. That we'll both have the chance to be filled and to pour our little lives out for the sake of the kingdom. But I think God's going to grow something different in this new season. And will you just, will you lean in for a moment? Can I, I just want to, I just want to say this as clearly as I can. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. That you're not looking for somebody who's just like Ryan. You're, you're looking for the person that God would call for the next task, for the next season to lead this church to a place that I didn't lead it to. And so here's one of my pleas. One of my, my pleas with you is that you would support the next lead pastor of South Fellowship Church, the next person who's a servant with a task of watering this unique field right here in Littleton, that you would support that person with the same love and support and care that you've supported me with from day one, from day one. And they're going to be different, and different isn't bad. Different is what this church probably needs to move into the next season. So that's one implication. Second implication is this. My task is changing, but that doesn't mean that yours is. That doesn't mean that yours is. I've said it before, and I'll say it again, that transitions are times for the church to rise up to say God's planted something in me also, and maybe you've been sitting on the sidelines for a while wondering, A, is this the church for me, or wondering, what do I have to contribute? I want you to, re you to reject the idea that you don't have anything to give, and I want this to be the season where you put your hand in the air and go, what might it look like for me, for me, to pour my life out just a little bit more in this church for the glory of God? Because you're a servant too, and as the Apostle Paul would write to the church at Ephesus, you are, you are his workmanship. In the original language, in the Greek, that, that word is poema, and it means poem or song. You're God's song, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you should walk into them. Your work matters. And when Paul says, listen, who's Paul and who's Apollos? We're nothing. He's not saying that their work doesn't matter. He's saying the story is not about us. It's about Jesus. In verse 6, he says, I planted, Apollos watered, and I just, that image is one that I'll carry with me, that as a pastor, I'm just a man with a can following a God who's got a plan. But God is the one who gave the growth. God is the one who gave the growth. So neither he knew pl who plants nor he who waters is anything, but it's God who gives growth. It's this mysterious inner working of our work and God's and God's spirit and our sweat, and it makes something beautiful. And I think the call is to recognize that our greatest blessings are, are the work of his hands, not the result of our labor. When you think about this, when you plant a garden, at the end of the summer, assuming that it grows, which is unlike our garden, but if, if it does, very rarely do you look at it and go, I'm amazing, I'm awesome. It's, no, there's this like mysterious combination of soil and water and rain and photosynthesis and all of these things that I had zero control over that happened. And, and I think our lives in so many ways are just the exact same thing. It's really good. It's really good. Whether you're a follower of Jesus here or not, it's really good for us every once in a while to pause and remember that the best things in our life aren't the result of our work. I mean, think about that. The best things in life are not the result of your work. Whether it's a friendship I mean, certainly there's work that goes into that, but, but did you arrange the meeting? Did you pursue that out? I mean, no, it's, did you create your um, exact personality that would mesh with this person? No, so much of that is gift. 
Um, if you're married, the same is true of a marriage. If you have kids, the same is true of your kids. That, that the greatest blessings in your life are not the work of your hands. They're the result of his labor, his work, his goodness, his grace, and his mercy. And as I've had the chance over the last few months to reflect on the things that I'm most grateful for here at South, I want to affirm this once again, that my greatest blessings here are not the work of my hands. They're the result of his spirit. His hands, not my labor. So a few things that I've just reflected on. It's been so fun to see because ministry and church is all about people. It's been so fun to see God grow this church, grow this church. See more people come to know and to love Jesus. That's been an absolute blessing for me. I'm, I'm shocked at what God has done. To see him clarify our mission and our values. That when we had a discussion on our elder board about changing our mission statement to be helping people live in the way of Jesus with the heart of Jesus, it's a huge, huge step for an organization to change their mission statement. And for us, it was one part of one meeting and we just went, yeah, this feels exactly like what God's been doing. And this is exactly who we are. And for me as a pastor to carry that banner and to just go, oh man, there's such alignment in my soul with this church has been an absolute joy. I didn't create that, God did that. To look at our values on the wall and go, those are things I'd give my life to. Absolutely. Pursuing the presence of God, practicing relationship with him, uh, helping people move towards wholeness, being and living together as a family of believers, being rooted in the scriptures and grounded in the scriptures. And then there's one more that I forgot. What, which is it? Anyone? What? Renewal. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, renewal. Over the last seven years, we've, when, I, when we got here, there was around $300,000 in debt. We've seen God wipe that out miraculously, move us to a place of financial wholeness. We've seen God birth the young adult ministry here. We've seen him start in the last seven years a Celebrate Recovery ministry where people are getting free from hurts and habits and hangups. I can assure you that is not the work of my hands. It's not the work of Nicole's hands. She's doing an amazing job leading that ministry, and I'm so grateful for her partnership. But it's nothing that we do. It's the way that God works when we show up and use our gifts. We've seen support groups started that address mental health issues, divorce, addiction, and grief. Praise God. We've seen the food bank remodeled. That was a lot of the work of our hands. <laughs> Specifically, <laughs> Bill and Aaron and Sharon and Larry and so many others, John and so many others. But God's the one who's going to make it grow. He's the one that's going to make that meaningful. Not us. Not us. We've seen family promise started here where we get the chance to open our facility for families experiencing homelessness to come and live for a week and try to get their feet back under them in partnership with 12 other churches around this area to create seamless transitions for people to hopefully find jobs and find a place to land. Man, you guys, that's good work. But God infuses it with meaning. God infuses it with meaning. I'm so grateful that in the last seven years, We've seen God move in such a way where South Fellowship now has female pastors. Personally, I am so grateful for that. I'm so grateful for that because I always said I wanted to raise my daughter in a church where she saw strong female leaders. We've seen missionaries sent out. We've seen spiritual formation and practices and taking discipleship seriously in the forefront. And I've seen a staff that has grown together, that loves each other, that is like family. And, and I can just stand before you and tell you, I'm just a man with a can. <laughs> trying my best to follow a God who's got a plan. And it's the work of his hands. Not our labor. Not our labor. Keith 
Graham Keith was the treasurer for the Billy Graham Association and one of Billy's uh, mo- longtime friends. And he was in a, an elevator and somebody else was in there with Billy and the other guy said to him, or he knew that he was working with, with Billy and he said to Billy Graham, he said, you're Billy Graham, aren't you? And he said, yes. And well, the man said, you are a truly great man. And Billy responded, no, I'm not a great man. I just have a great message. And I would say the same thing. Verse 9, for we are God's fellow workers. So so just to, I just want to set this straight, fellow workers. Paul and Apollos, fellow workers. Dale Schlafer, Brad Stray, Ryan Paulson, fill in the blank. Not competitors, fellow workers. Just people with a can and some water doing our best, right? Fellow workers, not competitors. You're God's field. You, church, God's field. We are God's field, God's building. And according to the grace God has given me, like a skilled master uh, builder, I laid a foundation, Paul said, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds. It's important how you work. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one that's laid, which is Jesus Christ. Christ, which is Jesus Christ. And I just want to remind you that understand that your fruitfulness in the past and in the future is determined simply by your, by our foundation. And our foundation has a name. His name is Jesus. He's unshakable, immovable. He's the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, next Sunday, which by the way, by the way, I, it gave me just such immense joy to see the feedback of from Larry preaching and Billy preaching last week to know, man, we have got some great communicators in this church, don't we? People that love Jesus and love the scriptures that are going to continue to do a great job while we search for whomever would come next. But that God, Jesus, is the foundation. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the head of this church. He's the senior pastor that you'll just get another second under shepherd. And where we build, where we build matters. Where you build matters, not just as a church, but as a person. Jesus would say, listen, you're either building your life on sand or you're building your life on rocks, but the foundation that you lay will determine the fruitfulness that comes from your life. So where is it? Where is it? And so as Aaron and the team come forward, I just want to end by reading one of my favorite verses to you and giving just a little bit of commentary, passages of scripture. So we're going to sing one last song and then um, we're going to get the chance to hug a little bit and say goodbye. Here's what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 1 verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. And I just want you to know, South Fellowship, that, that... I I will remember, Kelly and I will remember this church. Not only because you took a risk on a 31-year-old guy who had no senior pastor experience and were gracious with me while I learned, really gracious with me, but because we've grown to love you deeply. We really have. And so when we remember you, not just you collectively as a church, but you individually, When we remember you, we will do so with fondness and with gratitude, and and we'll thank Jesus. He says, always in every prayer of mine for you, for all of you making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I'm so grateful that the last seven years hasn't been me building a ministry. It's been us linking arms and hearts together for the sake of the kingdom. That this really has been partnership. And I'm so grateful for that. Paul says, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Hear me, South. God is not leaving you. He has great things in store for you. 
He's committed to the plans that he has for this church. He's committed to the plans that he has to you personally. And this is our chance, both collectively, because Kelly and I are in this too. I mean, we're stepping out, free solo style, sort of going, all right, God, you've been so good to us this last seven years, so good. And we're just going to do our best to trust that if this is where you lead, this is where you'll provide, that you'll be good to us too. But hear me, South, God is not done with you. I believe, I firmly believe with everything in me that the best days of South Fellowship Church are in front of her. And finally, I'd say this to you. It's right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you all in my heart. For you're partakers of grace with me that we both have tasted and seen God is good, that our eternal home is him, that we have the opportunity to make our home in him today. And so Paul says those things knit us together and, and they drill relationships deep within us. And Kelly and I would say to you all as a community of faith, but also as individuals, you are deeply, deeply, deeply in our hearts. And we love you dearly. So South, continue to chase after Jesus. Continue to serve the people around you in this community and continue to love each other well. You've done it for seven years. I have no doubt that you'll continue doing it into the future. And whatever can God gives you to water in the field that he plants you in, do so knowing that he's the one at work. Amen. Would you stand with me?